Hello everyone, welcome to the class once again. I hope you're all doing good and you're the best of your health. I hope you have ever watched the first lecture of this chapter and in that we learned about the concept of longitudinal stress and we learned about what is tensile stress and compressive stress. In today's class we'll go further ahead from where we have stopped in the last class and we'll understand the concept of volume stress. So let's go ahead with the topic of today's class that is volume stress. Now till now you, would have, you must have realized about the concept of stress. This is nothing but actually force per unit area. That is what we have learned till now because a force was acting on a rod and then you evaluated what is the tensile stress as the normal force divided by the area of cross section. Now let's understand about volume stress. Now suppose if you take a small object, it may be of any structure, any shape and you apply a force from all the directions of the object such that the force acts on each part of the object. What I mean to say if you take a small object, okay, and let's say on each part you are going to exert a force which is perpendicular to the surface at each point. Remember it has to be normal to the surface at each point. Let's say this is the force from all directions that is acting on the object. Now if this force is normal to the surface, the force should be the force acting this should be first requirement it has to be normal to the surface at each point this is what I have shown you normal to the surface at each point second requirement it should be proportional with respect to the area at which point you're checking let's say if you're checking a wider area that means the force should be of larger magnitude. And if you're checking a smaller area, the force should be of smaller magnitude. It should be proportional, force should be proportional to the area of contact. It is proportional to the area where you are referring to the amount of force. This is what this force should be. It should be normal to the surface. It should be proportional to the area. Now let's go ahead, let's understand the concept of volume stress. Now you see here, if I take a very small amount or let's say if I take a small area on this surface, let's say this area is delta S. The force acting on this small particle or on this small surface that we have imagined, this force is given as F. So volume stress will be given as volume stress on this surface will be let me write this as s v this will be equal to the force acting divided by delta s now how to understand in a more better way the same concept if you take a small object and immerse in a liquid we know that at any point if the object is small at any point the pressure remains same and that depends upon the height of the liquid column at every point the pressure will remain same the force acting at every point will be same and that will be equal to pressure into delta s so if you take an object and immerse in a liquid so force acting on it will be equal to pressure into delta s where s is the surface area of the small object we know this now if you go ahead and evaluate the volume stress if you go ahead and evaluate the volume stress you are going to obtain this as this will be given as force by area and here force is nothing but pressure into area divided by area this is what we are obtaining from here can you make out volume stress is nothing but pressure of the liquid at that particular height Remember you have to take a small object because if you take larger object pressure is going to vary with respect to the height from the topmost surface on the topmost height that you are going to see pressure is going to vary. So you have to keep the height of the you have to keep the dimension of the object to be very small okay at a particular point so that the pressure will be uniform at that particular position and it will be acting uniformly at all points of the object that you can observe in this figure also. This was a small description of the volume stress. So we have learned about the longitudinal stress. In longitudinal stress, I told you two things. 
first the tangential stress and the second one was the due to the normal force we learned about that is actually the longitudinal stress in that that is the tensile stress that we have seen and when you have taken a uniform rod and the force was acting perpendicular to this area of cross section then we evaluated the tensile stress next we have also seen compressive stress when you are going to apply a force so that you can compress the object the compressive stress can be evaluated as force per unit area next we learned about the volume stress now let's go to the other part that is the strain now what this stress they're gonna do they're gonna deform the object now depending on the ratio of the deformation with respect to the original shape and size we can evaluate the strain developed in the body see what i mean to say here the next part that is the strain so let's understand the next term that is strain strain is also of various types first of all let's understand the longitudinal strain longitudinal strain then we will understand in it tensile strain now see whenever you're going to apply a force on an object its length is going to change if an object the natural value of length is l and it changes by a small amount delta l so initial natural value if i take initial natural value of length natural value of length that is given as length now after application of the stress that is after applying a force it gets deformed and its length changes by a small amount let's say delta l so after application of stress its new length will become l plus delta l now what is the strain developed strain developed is the ratio of the change in length divided by the original length so we'll be having the longitudinal strain longitudinal strain developed in the body this will be nothing but delta l by l this is the value of longitudinal strain that will be developed within the body remember you have to take 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 the change in length divided by the original or natural value that is the l similar to this similar to this we have tensile strain similar to this we have tensile strain and as you must be remembering in what sense i have used tensile term now when the length is changed all across the length of the rod or the object when the length is changed all across the length of the rod that we have taken then tensile strain is developed this strain i am using the term s t for strain s t for strain and tensile strain developed will be given by here let's say the natural length first of all let me give you the natural length before applying the stress the natural length is given as let's say l here and after applying force after applying the stress the new length becomes new length becomes l plus delta l the tensile strain developed the tensile strain developed that will be equal to delta l by l again the change in length because this time the force is acting perpendicular to the area of cross section of the surface perpendicular to the area of cross section surface so what i mean to say here imagine this is the rod this is the rod and the force acting on it are given in this way force acting on it are given in this way so suppose on the based upon on this application of force what happens its length changes by a small amount delta i am representing here only its length changes i 
I have shown only one part. This is how the length is going to change. Let's say this amount is delta L. So the strain developed will be nothing but delta L by L. See here, let me also show you that this length is given as L and hence the strain developed will be delta L by L. And this is tensile strain that you should know. And the force was acting normal to the area of cross section. In the earlier case, if you were, if you were confused what is the difference between longitudinal strain and tensile strain, in longitudinal strain evaluation, the force may not be perpendicular to the area of cross section. That could act in any other way. But you have to see the natural value of the length that changes by amount delta L and then you have to evaluate the strain as delta L by L. In that case, we are not confining ourselves that tensile stress is acting. No, with tensile stress, then it is not necessary. The force can act in along any direction, not necessary to be perpendicular to the area of cross section. Do remember this small point. We are done with longitudinal strain. In, in it, we got tensile strain. What more can we have? Next is shear strain. Let us understand the shear strain. And if you have any problem right now in getting the term strain, when we do problems based upon this, you will find that it's easy and not too tough. The next one is shear strain. Now we have next one that is the shear strain this is quite simple if you remember i told you about the tangential stress in the concept of tangential stress we saw what force was acting tangential to the surface area see here i'll show you first explain i'm trying to explain you this with this illustration with this diagram see when we started the first class we saw that what we did, we took a cross-sectional area here, we applied a force F along both sides. Now its component acting along the surface, that is this component which was the tangential component Ft was taken out. Now what this force going to do? It will try to change the shape. but you will find that there will be no linear motion of this surface. What I mean to say, you will imagine again a square surface. Imagine again a square surface. Now suppose you apply a force along the direction as I am going to show you. If you apply a force, one along here, one along here, one along here and one along here. Let's say the forces are acting along this direction as shown. Let me write this forces as F, F, F and F. You can observe very easily the net force on this square surface is zero. The net force on this square surface will come out to be zero. So F net I'm writing as zero. And net torque will be also zero. You'll find that the net rotatory effect will be also zero. There will be no net torque there will be no net torque that will be also zero about the center of the square surface that we have taken net torque will be also coming out to be zero that means there will be no linear motion there will be no linear acceleration there will be no rotational motion now what what will happen upon the application of these forces let me show you another figure which will try to enhance our understanding of this concept this is square surface we took this was the surface that we have taken. Now, due to the application of force, its orientation is going to change. This is what I am going to show you. Its orientation is going to change. This is what will happen. Because you are applying a force in this way. So, it is going to disturb. It is going to reach a disturbed state. Let me say you this height is given as H and the linear displacement of the surface from its original position, this is given as x. Let us say this angle formed is theta due to the application of force. This is what the state that has been reached upon the application of the force. Although there is no linear acceleration, net force is zero, I am not showing any linear acceleration, I am only showing a deformation. Now what is shear strain? 
shear strain is given as or you can also call it as tangential strain shear strain this is given as shear strain strain shear this will be given as x by h x by h this is the length x and this is the height of the square surface that we have taken that is the h so x by h will be shear strain and it can also be seen that this is nothing but tangent of the angle strain shear i am writing in this way so that it will be very easy for you all to understand shear strain hope you would have understood these two formula used for evaluating the value of shear strain not too tough very simple not too tough it's very simple and you can see that it is just on a solid surface like say if i have a duster here what i'm going to do if i apply a force on one of its surface see i have taken a new pad if i apply a force on this so what i'm going to do i'm only trying to disturb the surface and when the surface gets disturbed it will be formed in this way when the surface gets disturbed it will form in this way the shear strain the shear strain developed will be given by this linear displacement of the top surface and then the height you have to take the ratio the height of this duster you have to take the ratio you will get the shear strain that is given as x by h or that can be tangent of the angle theta which has formed clear i believe that longitudinal strain tensile strain and shear strain would be clear to you all don't worry about the two terms longitudinal strain and tensile strain remember the concept of tensile strain because that is what we will be using in the coming concepts in the coming section of this chapter we'll be using the concept of tensile strain now although i'm only describing all about the conceptual things of all this terms We'll be using, we'll be applying all these terms as you proceed with the chapter and we'll be seeing where numericals will be given and you have to apply all this concept that you're learning. So after learning the concept of tensile strain and shear strain, let's learn about volume strain. Volume strain is not too difficult to understand. Any object you take, if you apply same pressure from all the sides, so what is going to happen? The object is going to compress. That is, its volume is going to change. What I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you a three-dimensional object. Let's say any object you take. Okay. It has got, this is a three-dimensional object. It has got some volume. Hope you are understanding with this figure that I'm trying to depict a three-dimensional object in this way. Take any object, place in a liquid and let's say pressure at that point is P. So the stress will be acting, that will be P. But due to this pressure, due to the force acting at every point, what will happen? Its volume is going to decrease. There will be change in volume. The volume strain can be similarly referred to what we have learned earlier. It will be change in volume with respect to the ratio of change in volume with respect to the original volume. Let's say original volume is V. Original volume is equal to V and new volume, let me write new volume is equal to V plus delta V. Delta volume is changed, you must be thinking why I am doing V plus delta V. I am going to use delta V as negative so that will be giving me V minus delta V. Don't worry about that. So volume strain that will be developed, this will be given as volume strain. Strain volume. This can be written as minus delta V by V. Why minus delta V by V? Because delta V we are going to check. That will be negative. So to keep the term positive, I'm using minus. This overall term has to be positive. So that's why I'm writing minus delta V by V. 
because delta V will be negative here. So the volume strain developed will be minus delta V by V. Hope that you are getting the simple, simple terms. And now we'll be relating strain with stress. The most important part. Hope that you've understood the concept of volume strain. Take an object, compress it, try to apply force from all sides, equal magnitude of force. Due to this application of force, what happens is volume changes, the change in volume divided by the total volume will give you the strain developed. And remember, you have to keep the magnitude as positive. That's what's required. Or, although you won't be required to calculate only the magnitude, then you can give the positive value and if it's required, you need to give the exact volume strain. So you can give a negative value also that will automatically refer that the body is contracting. If it's required, if you mention that, you mention the magnitude. Then you give the, if it's required, give only the magnitude. Then what you do, you provide only the positive value of strain. And suppose if it's required, give only strain then you can give the positive or negative depending upon the calculated volume. The body is compressed, its volume changes. So you can give the strain to be negative, then it's not a problem. But if it's required, if it's only magnitude is required, then you can give the positive value of the strain. But need not to worry about the signs because the place where we'll be using, where they'll be using only positive value of the strain. Let's go ahead and let's go to the next main topic of the chapter that is the Hooke's law. Hooke's law is generally for solids and in this case Hooke's law says that for a particular matter, for matter the ratio of stress to strain is a constant for any object or for any particular matter. It says that the ratio of stress to strain developed on an object developed on an object is constant for a particular material is constant for a certain material that is for brass it will be fixed for copper it will be fixed for iron it will be having a different value and so on but it will be constant for any particular specific material that you are seeing into what I mean to say Hooke's law says that ratio of stress to strain will be constant. This term will be constant. Now if you take a rod and you apply tensile stress on it, what is going to happen? That means you are going to apply force from both sides. What is going to happen? It is going to expand. Its length is going to elongate. And due to the elongation, strain will be developed within the rod. So the ratio as per Hooke's law will be constant. For a rod, for the linear rod, we take this ratio as Young's modulus. So, next term within this Hooke's law, let's study about Young's modulus. Young's modulus, the ratio of stress to strain, if the stress is tensile stress the ratio of tensile stress to tensile strain this constant is known as Young's modulus now what can we be mean what can we mean from this take a rod Due to the application of the stress, let me apply forces from both sides to show you the tensile stress. Let's say F is the force acting on this. And let's say its natural length is given as L. 
you can observe here. Now, area of cross section that has been provided that is given as A. Stress developed will be simply force per unit area. This is what we know, stress is nothing but force per unit area. And the strain will be change in length divided by the length. Now, due to the application of this stress, let's say its length changes. And let me draw the new position where the rod reaches. Let me show you here the new position of the rod. Now, due to the application of stress, what will happen? Its length is going to change. So, I am drawing this new position of the rod. Now, see length that will be change that will be very small in magnitude compared to the original length. This is what we know. Forces were acting. Now, due to the application of the forces, we got the length changed. Now, the change in length that has occurred, let's take that as delta L. So, we can write stress to be equal to force per unit area and the strain that will be delta L upon L. L is the natural length and the change in length that has occurred that is sum of this distance and this separation this will be equal to delta L. Now remember every time whenever I am using this force the force due to which the stress was generated that force will always act from both the ends of the object. Remember, you have to take the force from both the ends. Similar is the case even for hanging also. If you hang a rod, you might hang a small object from the bottom end of the rod. But you need to also consider that the ceiling also will apply the same magnitude of force. So both forces, the both forces are acting at the both the ends. Now Young's modulus says that ratio of stress to strain is actually Young's modulus. So I'm writing here stress remember I am talking about tensile stress and I am talking about tensile strain this will be F by A divided by delta L by L easy this will become Y is equal to F L by A delta L many a places we are going to use this ratio and you will understand how in other chapters also we will be using this Young's modulus term that is y equals to fl by a delta l. Now proceeding further and before that let me just give you a quick recap of what we have done. We took a rod, okay, applied tensile stress. Due to the application of tensile stress, the rod lengths changed. And as the length changed, we saw that the change in length was given as delta l. Now you just evaluate the stress that will be f by a. Evaluate the strain developed, that will be delta L by L. The ratio of stress to strain, that will be constant for this particular rod. And if it's iron, it will be having some stress to strain ratio. And if it's copper, it will be having some stress to strain ratio. That will be different for iron, that will be different for copper. But if you take a different length of rod, the same Young's modulus is going to occur whether the rod is of 10 meter or whether the rod is for 20 meter, if the material is same, if it's iron. This is what it has been said that the ratio of stress to strain developed on an object is constant for a certain material. For that material, the Young's modulus will be constant. It will not depend upon the length that you have chosen to experiment. Okay, so we got this. Young's modulus is just ratio of stress to strain applied. Stress is F by A, strain is delta L by L. Solve it, you'll get F into L upon A into delta L. We got this ratio and that ratio is known as the Young's modulus and that has been written here. Let's do a very quick example on Young's modulus. Hope you would be having the idea of unit to be used in the case of Young's modulus. So if you are having any doubt what's the unit to be used for Young's modulus, that would be the unit of stress because in the denominator we have strain that is the length divided by length so that will have no units so we'll be having only the unit of stress that is 
न्यूटन पर स्क्वायर मीटर फोर्स पर यूनिट एरिया दैट इज द स्ट्रेस एंड द यूनिट यूज विल बी न्यूटन पर स्क्वायर मीटर लेट्स बी वेरी क्विक एंड लेट्स डू अ क्विक प्रॉब्लम ऑन यंग्स मॉडल इट्स गिवन दैट वी हैव अ रॉड अ लीनियर रॉड हुज मास एंड इज अदर एंड एक्चुअली यू हैव सपोर्टेड the rod you have tied the one end of the rod with a mass of let's say 4 kg rod and it's also given that its length is 20 meter its length is going to 20 meter now one end of the rod you have tied an object of let's say mass 4 kg one end of rod it's tied with an object of mass let's say 4 kg is what has been given now due to the this weight the stress is developed and there's some change in length of the rod the change in length is measured as 4 mm by 4 mm the rod the length of the rod is changed has been changed so you applied the mass you got this this you got you have been provided with this also now it's also given that the radius of one of the face is given as 2 cm and the rod is hanging vertically what the situation says rod is hanging vertically the situation is something like this let's me write here that will be good because we have more space here Take a rod, hang it vertically. You got this. Take a rod, hang it vertically. This is how the rod is being suspended. Now, from this one end, you have suspended a mass four kg. All the variables have been given length. the mass which is hanging the radius of this face this all has been given now you have to find out the young's modulus of the rod find out the young's modulus we all know that young's modulus is nothing but stress by strain this is what we know so if i put all the values this will be fl by a delta l young's modulus fl force force will be due to the weight of this block that will be mg L area will be pi r square delta L substitute all the values mass is nothing but given as 4 kg and g take it as 10 length is given as 20 meter now pi will be used as 3.14 or you can write this as 22 by 7 multiplied by r square that is the 2 cm so can we write this as 2 into 2 multiplied by 10 to power minus 4 it's given in cm so write convert into square meter and delta l that is given as 4 mm 4 into 10 to power minus 3 this is what you are going to obtain delta l now we have to just simply solve this equation and we'll be obtaining the value of young's modulus you can see this 4 and this 4 is cancelled out then we have 20 this 2 will cancel out 10 times so you'll be left with the 7 go into numerator 7 into 10 into 10 so you'll be having 100 and the denominator will be having 1 2 is gone so 1 2 is left 22 into 2 that will be 44 multiplied by 10 to power minus 4 10 to power minus 3 10 to power minus 7 7 2 9 so this will be equal to 7 by 44 into 10 to power 9 newton per square meter further we can further simplify this that you can do on your own that's very simple part that has been left now you got to understand how can you evaluate the young's modulus young's modulus is nothing but you have to check what is the stress acting on the rod what is the strain that has been developed take the ratio you will get the stress is to strain ratio and that will be constant and that constant this constant is known as young's modulus i'll give a quick recap of what we have done till now we learned about the first of all we started volume stress that was 
just left to understand in the concept of stress and then we learned about we started with strain we learned about tensile strain that was the most most important part tensile strain long term strain within that we have tensile strain that is the most important part then we learned about the shear strain that is the strain developed due to the tangential force acting on an object and hope you have got the idea how can we evaluate the value of shear strain next we also learned about the concept of volume strain now using all these strains we'll be evaluating different value of hooke's law modulus actually next we started understanding the concept of hooke's law hooke's law said said that and his law says that the ratio of stress to strain is constant and when you take a linear rod and we're going to apply tensile stress on the rod the tensile strain will be developed the ratio of this tensile stress to tensile strain is known as Young's modulus. We solved a problem on this. Now, suppose Young's modulus is given and you can easily evaluate other required variables. Let me show you a problem. How you can find out other things if Young's modulus has been provided to you. Let's say it's given that Young's modulus of iron is 8 into 10 to the power 8 Newton per square meter. This is what has been given. It's given that its length is, let me take 10 meter. Its length is 10 meter. Now, the radius, the area of cross section of the, let's say the radius is given as let me write this as 2 by pi or let me write this as 40 by pi 40 by pi centimeter seems to be very large okay take it in this way now Young's modulus is given length is given radius is given suppose it is hanged with a mass of let's say 10 kg you have to find out the change in length is what is required the rod is hanging the mass is hanging as shown in the similar way just now we have done this rod is hanging from this one part of the rod we have hanged a mass and this time mass is 10 kg so due to this mass stress will be developed and strain will be developed the strain we have to evaluate the change in length we know y is equal to f by a delta l by l so change in length you can easily see this will be given as f by a y l will be here force will be mg length will be here area will be pi r square multiplied by Young's modulus this will come out to be mass that has been hanging 10 kg multiplied by g multiplied with length 10 meter this is what has been given now we should also mention pi r square r is given as 40 by pi centimeter 40 by pi whole square into 10 to power minus 4 this is what we can write and young's modulus is given as 8 into 10 to power 8 8 into 10 to the power 8 this is what we're going to obtain now can we simplify this it's very easy to simplify you'll be having here 1 upon 40 whole square and 1 pi 1 pi will be cancelled out pi will go up so you'll be left with 10 to power 3 pi and you'll be getting 40 whole square multiplied with 8 into 10 to power 4 this is what you'll be obtaining 8 into 10 to power 4 this is what you'll be obtaining we can easily simplify this you will be getting this as 4 square 16 16 into 8 that can be evaluated 16 9 4, 128 you will be getting 128 so pi upon 128 and you'll be having two zeros here 10 to power 6 this will be equal to 10 to power minus 3 meter or we can write this as pi upon 128 millimeter this is how you can evaluate the change in length this is what we can see so 
just recapping from all the concepts that we have learned, the most important is Hooke's law. The ratio of stress to strain is constant. And when we have taken a linear object, the ratio of stress to strain that will be taken as Young's more or less, then whatever the required things is asked in the question, you can easily evaluate when you know how to apply the Hooke's law. In the next class, we'll be proceeding from where I'm living here. We'll be understanding more in the Hooke's law and we'll be seeing more things in this chapter. Till the time, do revise, do practice well. I'll see you all in the next class. Thank you, everyone.